So it's, it's very important for anyone, not just marketers, but also, you know, founders or, or product managers when they go in and develop their product to, to do research first to see what the market is looking for. Hey guys, we have Kai Yong here with me. He is a SaaS marketer. Currently, is the head of growth of Keyword2io, a global SaaS company offering digital marketing research tools for SEO specialists, search engine marketers, and digital marketers. Previously, he was the head of growth of Next Academy and also the advertising lead for Mind Valley. Kai Yong, welcome to the show. Hey Bob, thanks a lot for having me on your show. Um, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, actually, to the audience, uh, me and Kai Yong, we uh, met up in KL and he's based here in Kuala Lumpur and Kibat 2 I always also based here in Kuala Lumpur. Actually, we live like maybe five kilometers away, but we're doing this on Zoom. It's very interesting. So, Kai Yong, <laughs> tell us like, you know, first, first and foremost, you know, you're a SaaS marketer. Tell us uh, first, what is Kibat 2 I O? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, basically, Kibat 2io yeah. or keyword tool is, uh, you know, as the name suggests, it is a keyword research tool for digital marketers, for SEO specialists, for advertisers, uh, paid search advertising specialists who, who want to use, uh, who want to do keyword research before they, they embark on their campaigns, right? So, it's, you know, we help them by giving them uh, keyword suggestions uh, pulled from Google Autocomplete and other search engines such as YouTube, Bing, uh, app, app store and so forth to, you know, to help them find some really good keywords uh, before they, they launch their campaigns. Cool. Yeah. Um, why, why do um, you know, marketers or SEO specialists needs, need a keyword tool? Uh, are, there are a lot of alternatives out there, but why, why specifically they, they need a keyword tool as advanced as yours? Yeah. So, you know, a lot of people, they, they create content, they create blog articles and stuff like that. Um, but if they don't do the keyword research, they won't know exactly how many people are searching for these terms. So you're basically blindly creating content. And next thing you know, you don't see much results. You don't see traffic coming into your websites. You don't see any sales. So I would say before you embark on any marketing campaign, the first step is really to find out what is the demand for your products and services. And once you you know, have an idea about how, how many people are searching for your keywords, for the search terms, uh, you also want to see you know, how competitive the niche is. Uh, and then only go in and create content, uh, products, etc., etc. So it's, it's very important for anyone, not just marketers, but also you know, founders or, or product managers when they go in and develop their product to, to do research first to see what the market is looking for. I see. Um, I, so another question I would ask you, you touched on a good point when it comes to research, you know, as, as a very uh, experienced marketer uh, for many years, um, what sort of research besides keywords that you would actually do, you know, before launching or before uh, coming out with a marketing campaign? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that, you know, it's not just a straightforward product market fit, like saying that, oh yeah, this is a problem I want to solve and whatnot. Uh, personally, I think, you know, it, you have to look at it in a multi, multi-dimensional way when it comes to, uh, you know, launching a successful business, for example, right? Uh, let's say you are creating a marketplace mm-hmm. and the marketplace is supposed to solve some problem uh, you know, connecting buyers and sellers and all that, right? So yeah. you determine that there's a need for, you know, buyers and sellers and whatnot, but you also must see things like um, what channels are you going to use to mm. scale your business? What is the best channel, right? And in some cases, you find that you have a business idea which is kind of kind of advanced, you know, maybe the market sophistication in the area you're targeting is, is still quite low. Uh, and people are not readily searching for, you know, search terms related to your business idea, right? Uh, in that scenario, you, you can't really, like, launch a business in that market yet, you know? You, you have to find, like, an alternative uh, 
acquisition channel and whatnot. So when it comes to research, I think uh, you have to consider these are these are just two factors, but there are a lot more. Uh, we can talk more about it later, you know, if, if time permits. But, uh, you know, keyword research is, in the end of the day, it's, it's still one of the quickest and easiest ways to find out if people are looking for what you're offering. Oh, cool. So, uh, keyword research is obviously an important part of research. Um, so, Keyword 2 I.O. is a SaaS tool. So, can you briefly explain what is a SaaS, you know, just to get our audience up to date? Yep, sure. Um, so, so SaaS stands for Software as a Service, uh, but in a more simpler terms, it's basically you are offering uh, a software on a cloud, on the cloud, and people can use your tool uh, by paying you a monthly or annual subscription fee. So they, basically that's what it is. A keyword tool is a SaaS tool. Uh, you know, we have a web app uh, where basically people can, you know, when they subscribe to us, uh, they can log in and then they can use the tool uh, as much as they want to do keyword research. Yeah. Cool. So having experience in SaaS marketing, how, how is it different from uh, B2C marketing? Um, yeah, I mean, I used to work in a company called Next Academy and, you know, acquisition was a lot more straightforward back then. It was just close sales, close sales, close sales, right? Uh, and when I joined the keyword tool, I, I learned that, you know, it's, it's much different in a SaaS company because you don't just have to worry about acquisition. You also have to worry about um, keeping your customers because they are basically on a monthly subscription, much like uh, how you are on like a, you know, telco plan. Uh, You're paying every month to a particular service provider. And if you don't like their services, you will change. You will go to another company. But if you like their services, they're just going to keep paying you money again and again every single month. So uh, in this sense, you know, it's, you know, I would say we don't want so much impulse buyers. We want people who really want to use our product and who will see long-term benefit of using our product because those guys uh, will tend to stay very long and their customer lifetime value is much higher and also when it comes to you know speaking of CLV uh, SAS also comes bundled with a lot of metrics which uh, previously I was not uh, you know accustomed to but when I came here I learned a lot about SAS metrics and how it impacts uh, businesses like ours yeah sure so um, so you, you talked about you know retaining customers that's a metric uh, sometimes you call churn so uh, can you explain briefly you know, what are the few key metrics when it comes to SaaS and, you know, uh, and we will move from there. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, you know, if you, you would just Google up SaaS metrics, you'll find like a whole list of them, right? But a lot of these metrics are just a play with the, uh, play with the numbers, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, semantics, you know, for example, retention and churn are just opposites of each other, right? Retention is how long a guy stays and churn is, you know, what is the rate in which customers uh, drop out unsubscribe from your tool uh, over uh, you know how much customers you had initially right so mm -hmm. very common metrics that uh, I can break it down for you is uh, monthly recurring revenue or MRR mm -hmm. basically what this means if it is like if you got you got a hundred customers for example using our tool and these customers are currently subscribed to your business. So every month, as long as they are subscribed to your business, they will continue to pay you X amount of dollars. So if you have 100 customers who are subscribed at a $100 plan to your tool, basically you get 100 times 100 a month. That's at least your monthly recurring revenue. And then there's also annual recurring revenue, which is also very commonly heard in the B2B SaaS space. Uh, that is basically MRR times 12, you know, and they also have, uh, you know, annual contract value as well, ACV. Uh, so that one uh, is going into the field of more to B2B sales uh, because when you're dealing with corporates and whatnot, big companies, they prefer to do things on an invoice basis and the, con the contract is usually one year or two year. But there's a calculation to somehow like factor in into a company's, uh, you know, bottom line, the numbers. Uh, the other very commonly used uh, SaaS metric is uh, churn. And churn is basically, you know, 
churn rate actually is the number of people who unsubscribe divided by the number of people who were subscribed initially, right? So if you have 100 customers subscribe and 10 people churned, that your churn rate is essentially 10%, right? Mm. Uh, you know, but not all is lost, you know, because the next month you still have 90 customers uh, out of your 100, there were 10 that churn, right? So still so have 90 customers who are still going to pay you, right? And so, of course, every month you're going to get new customers as well. So you kind of sort of maintain this steady state of, you know, influx of customers and people who are going to churn. Eventually, they will churn, right? Yeah. Uh, and our, our job as a marketer is to, of course, make it like, positive, right? Uh, your MRR growth needs to be positive if your company wants to grow. You don't want it to be stagnant. Stagnant is fine. You know, your company is not going to die. But if it goes down, that's, that's bad, right? Because it shows that people uh, don't, you know, there's something wrong with your product. People are not staying long and whatnot. Uh, hope, hope this makes sense. Like it's not yeah, yeah. too heavy. Just, just to recap, I think churn uh, basically means the net of dropout customers versus new acquired uh, users. I think that that's a fair a, sum, a fair summary. Yeah, you can and, say that again yeah. because churn is sorry for interrupting, but churn yeah, is sure. like you just have to make it clear that churn can be calculated in many ways. In fact, if you use different uh, uh, SaaS metrics uh, tools, they have a slightly different way of calculating churn, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but what's important is you know how they calculate it and you know how to to grow it or reduce churn in in this yeah. example, right? Yep, and to yeah. summarize, MRR is monthly recurring revenue, ARR is annual recurring revenue. I think there's one more. I think, can you explain the last one, which is CAC? Oh, CAC? C yeah. yeah, sure. Customer acquisition costs. Uh, basically, you know, if you are spending on paid ads or anything that requires, you know, like sales, hiring a sales team, usually they, they do factor uh, commission as well. Uh, you know, you obviously, Ideally, you want to be acquiring customers at a, the, at a CAC uh, lower than their CLB, their customer lifetime value, because you know you, you make money in the long run, right? So to give an example, if you know a typical customer of yours would pay you a thousand bucks over the lifetime of their subscription, you want to acquire this customer for less than a thousand bucks so you actually make a profit. And usually investors, they are uh, quite happy with, you know, if you can make your money back within a year, that's quite okay, quite decent already. So, you know, if you're playing the, the, the whole investor startup game thingy, you also have to think about these metrics, right? How, how, how long does it take for you to make your money back? How much does it cost to acquire a customer and whatnot? Cool. Is there an ideal ratio when it comes to CAC and lifetime value? So is there like 20% of lifetime value of is there an ideal one or it's, it's, yeah, it's unique for each case? Um, you know, from my research of other SaaS companies and, and so on, I find that a lot of them are happy with, uh, you know, one year to break even uh, because I think also they, they deal with a lot of annual contracts and, and stuff like that. But obviously, the sooner you can make back your money, the, the better, of course, you know, even better if you... you, you you can acquire customers at like close to nothing, you know, using SEO and free traffic methods or, or whatnot. But, uh, you know, realistically, it depends on your, your business, right? What, what is, what is the, the software, the SaaS uh, yeah. tool that you're offering? Um, what is the price point? There are a lot of things that come into play here. And I know for a fact that not every SaaS company, uh, you know, has the same... CAC uh, because like it's so dynamic, right? Some people have a thousand dollar per month product. Some people have a hundred dollar per month. Some people have ten dollar per month. So it varies, right? So when you say, uh, just to be very practical here, uh, when you say that they make it back in a year. So for example, the CAC is for example five hundred dollars. So is it you are saying that we have a monthly subscription that they are very happy to make five hundred dollars back in a year, or but yeah. Yeah, just like that. So after the first year, they will start to, you know, make money. Um, again, that is if you know that your customers will stay more than a year. Yeah. Yeah, right? Because you know, yeah. you can predict, right? What, what is the, the customer life, the, you know, uh, average customer lifetime value for your product? So you need to factor that in. 
right? If they, if you know that your guys drop out after the six month, obviously you cannot base your, your CAC to CLV ratio, you know, mm. in six months, uh, in, in one year, sorry. So it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of actually math going on. Mm -hmm. uh, you're running a SaaS. Uh, these are the things we look at every day. Uh, and as a SaaS marketer, you need to know these numbers uh, at your fingertips. Yeah. Uh, so you don't lose money, basically. Yeah. Um, so basically, explain to a lot of my uh, viewers uh, in the marketing community, can you briefly explain what is the funnel like when it comes to SaaS? You know, what are the best channels or what is the... It, it all depends, but what, in your experience, what are the best... Uh, channels uh, when it comes to the funnel for SaaS? How, how do you go from awareness or how do you go from ads to the conversion? Yeah. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, I don't think that there are too many SaaS companies in, in this region and those that are there, they are quite uh, secretive with their, their methods. They're like really low profile. I, tell you, I think they are killing it. That's why. <laughs> but anyways, where I'm getting at is, uh, you know, when it comes to like uh, awareness levels and, you know, bringing them down the funnel, I think that's the same uh, with any business, whether it's a SaaS company or, you know, a B2C or brick and mortar, you know, you always have to do the whole, you know, awareness and uh, what is that consideration and all that kind of funnel stuff, right? Uh, but in terms of marketing funnel specifically, how do you close customers? I think uh, it's quite uh, very, it varies quite a lot in a SaaS business because some people, they, they have to test different models, you know. Some people, they start with a free trial. Basically, you pay nothing and then after 14 days, you pay something, right? And some people, they don't give free trials at all, but they have like a free version, of a free tier like us. Uh, we have a free version of Keyword Tool. And uh, if you want more data related to the keywords, you, then you would upgrade, you know. So that one, ours is called free to use. Uh, and then there's also, you know, those with no free trial where sh straight up you should, you know, subscribe if you want to. Um, but most of them, the most common one I've seen is free trial uh, with credit card so that they are able to bill, bill you immediately after the trial period is up. But at least you had a, like a taste of it already, you know. Yeah, yeah, sure. That, that's a great part. And I think uh, the, the, the buzzword people use is the freemium model. So you get like free <laughs> when you, want, yep. you pay the premium, premium model. So uh, yep. just now we talk about metrics as a marketer, you know, you have an uh, eye open on the you know, key metrics churn, MRR and whatever. So are there any specific, uh, you know, tactics that you can do as a marketer, you know, to, for example, churn, uh, to, to keep the churn low or to increase it, to decrease the CAC. So as your experience, uh, as a marketer, uh, is there, are these things in your control and you know, what are the steps that you normally take to, to rectify them? Mm, yeah. I mean, all these things, uh, you know, it's, it's always in your control. You're in, you're in charge as a marketer. Uh, but it's also not just us. We have to work closely with the product team to make sure that, uh, you know, they're pushing out features that the customers want, they're fixing bugs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but from a marketing side, you know, there's a lot that we can do from the acquisition front and the churn reduction front. For example, acquisition is all about, you know, figuring out what are the cheapest channels to, to, bring lead, to get leads, to get them through the door, to turn them into customers. And for, you know, the churn reduction side, uh, there's a lot, right? Uh, you can implement onboarding funnels, teach people how to use it. You can educate them on the benefits of, you know, using the tool and also to continue using the tool because, you know, you want to kind of form that habit uh, building within them so that they come back and use your tool a lot. If they stop using your tool, they forget about it. And next thing you know, they churn. I see. Yeah. So is, uh, is there a lot of, uh, let's say, education when it comes to, you know, SaaS marketing, you know, like I see a lot of like webinars and things like that. Does it, does it work for you? What is your experience when it comes to education? Mm. Um, definitely, uh, you know, from the, the numbers we've seen, uh, education does play a part, uh, you know, in, in engaging your audience, getting them to come back, getting them to use the, the core features of your product. You know what I mean? And some other companies I've seen, they invest uh, heavily into education. They do like weekly webinars. They, of course, they have a full-time 
uh, content marketing departments, pumping out articles, but the articles can also be used for acquisition and so forth. Uh, so, you know, every day we're thinking about doing stuff like that. But I think what's most important is it's, it is measurable, you know. You don't want to say, oh yeah, this webinar is going to get people to stay, right? But h- how do you know, you know? A lot of people like to come up with ideas, but they don't have like numbers to back it up. So if you're going to try something, make sure you're, you're able to track it uh, and also to see whether it has an impact on the bottom line. Great, great stuff. Um, so uh, there, there is um, a debate going on. Like they, they always say, you know, when it comes to most marketing, but more so in SaaS, that there is this organic versus paid thing. You know, like, uh, of course, you know, from a tech perspective, preferably it's all organic. But do you have yeah. any uh, strategies, you know, when it comes to growing the organic side of, of uh, marketing? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, plenty of strategies, you know, of course, you know, if you want to play SEO, you definitely have to do keyword research. You know, I can't imagine anyone who says they, they're doing SEO and they're not already do keyword research. Like you first have to know what keywords uh, are relevant for your business and, you know, get start, get, you want to rank for those keywords, of course, and get traffic to your site. Uh, sometimes you might not want exactly, uh, I mean, there might not be people searching exactly for your product and that's quite normal, but you also want to target keywords within the space. You know what I mean? It's like HubSpot, they do a lot of inbound marketing. Uh, Maybe the searches, I didn't check, but maybe the searches for their CRM tool has increased over the years, but they focus heavily on educating uh, their prospects with other stuff like, you know, how to write an email funnel and stuff like that. After that, they go and sell them an email funnel, for email marketing tool. You know what I mean? So sometimes it's not as direct, right? You have to really do the proper keyword research to find out uh, what sort of keywords can bring targeted audiences to your to your tool or your website. And eventually, how what is the funnel, the marketing funnel you have on your website that's going to turn them into customers. Yeah. So, so uh, you talk a lot about uh, keywords. Um, and I think I've heard you uh, teach in a class that uh, there is a lot of opportunity when it comes to long tail keywords versus the, uh, the short tail keywords per se. Uh, so can you tell us the advantages or the differences between long tail and short term targeting short tail keywords? Yep, sure. So short tail keywords are typically, uh, you know, shorter phrases, like a keyword phrase that is like one or two words. And usually the search volume for these words are much higher, but also a lot more competitive. Like to rank for these keywords and get traffic from them is quite impossible if you're just starting out. So when you're starting out, you want to target, focus more on what we call a long tail keyword, which is a keyword phrase which consists of three or more words, typically. It could be even longer, you know. Uh, And, uh, you know, for example, questions. Questions is something that people use a lot when they, they search for something in Google and Google loves questions. They love to feed answers to to people ask questions, you see. So if you have a piece of content that answers directly whatever they're asking, uh, you have a higher chance of ranking for for that keyword and getting traffic from these guys. And as also, the good thing about it is if they're asking a question, you know that there is what I call search intent. Like they are looking, actively looking to solve a problem that they have. So you can be sure that this is very targeted traffic compared to, let's say, someone who searches for just two words, right? And you don't know where, where he is, uh, you know, in the awareness uh, level, right? So uh, questions is one way to, to target these guys. Also, because long tail keywords, they tend to have a lower search volume, uh, which is more the reason why you need a tool to tell you, you know, what are the questions that are worth targeting, you know, because you don't want to waste too much time, right? In resources, creating content for a question that not many people are asking. And this is where tools like uh, keyword tool like that come in to, to help to, you know, help people find good questions to answer. Yeah. Cool. Cool stuff. Um, let's move on to the conversion part of the funnel. So I, I remember you said you do a lot of A-B testing actively for, for you know, the conversion site. So can you give us an examples whether you test on colors or whatever A-B testing that makes, made a big difference to, to your conversions? 
uh, every time people ask me about conversion, they ask me, hey, what works, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> uh, no, it, it's interesting, right? Like, because I used to work at Mind Valley before and they also run tests all the time. And I get to, I speak to some of my colleagues, try to figure out, and I ask them the same question. I ask them, hey, what's working, what's not, you know? I mean, and what I found was, you know, it varies business to business, you know. One thing that works for one business might not work for another business. But in general, you you can test things like, uh, you know, copy, market sophistication, design, uh, UI, you know, little little hacks here and there. Uh, but you have to be very careful uh, because you, you need to know what is the conversion that you want to optimize for. Uh, for example, you want sales and not like checkout views because checkout views are not the same as sales, right? You might have a, a false positive if you have like, oh yeah, a lot of people are going to the checkout, but no one's actually buying more. You're just getting low, uh, how you say, uh, low quality traffic to a particular page. That's not what you want, you know? Uh, but in general, I think, you know, depending on the maturity of your business, the maturity le- level of your, your market, you, you, you can, if you haven't quite figured it out, I think it makes all the sense to test the, the market sophistication uh, on your sales page or landing page. Like, you know, what do, what, is your, what do people care about the most? You know, is it features? Is it benefits? Uh, you know, what, that sort of thing, you know, or, or you want to try something totally radical and go for like impulse buys, you know, like create some curiosity. So there are a lot of things you can, you can test, uh, you know, I can't remember from the top of my head. Maybe I can share that later. But there are some sites that they have really uh, good ideas for testing. But I'm I'm still again I'm a bigger fan of testing like marketing psychology as opposed to design. I think it, it's more effective and it it will really move the needle more than uh, changing a color of the button. You know, maybe that might work on on something that it has very high traffic, right? Like. You know, thousands of visitors every day, kind of thing. Because that for that those kind of pages, small tweaks can you can immediately see the difference already. But when it comes to testing things like sales conversion rate, uh, you need something more more powerful, more impactful. Yeah, great, great stuff. Uh, and uh, one of the things I find very interesting about your profile is uh, actually you you have been you have learned coding and you're a coder yourself. So, um, one of, I think I saw somewhere there's an article you written, like, you know, how every marketer should learn JavaScript. So can you tell us why, how does JavaScript help a digital marketer? Um, sure. Um, you know, it's, this is like something I'm, I'm still exploring and every day I'm learning something new and it's been really exciting for me for the, especially in the last couple of months because, you know, having an understanding of technologies like JavaScript uh, can really, really make you a better marketer. And here's why I say so. Uh, First of all, you have the power to manipulate anything that is on a page uh, without relying on third-party tools, uh, without relying on bugging your developers to change something from the back end. You can like run speed tests, you can track things really easily. And if you're work, uh, using like all those other services out there and there's a hundred and one events, uh, events are like things uh, that you want to track. You want to send it to these services, right? Like Google and Facebook ads and stuff like that. Uh, having understanding of JavaScript would let you effortlessly send these events here and there. So it really helps you to, to move very fast, right? To, to come up with experiments, to test things, to track everything accurately, you know, it's insane. But I'll give you an example, like I've been using, uh, yeah, JavaScript a lot in my marketing. And, uh, you know, I can make simple tweaks to my website based on uh, the, the visitor that comes to our website. Uh, for example, um, you know, your developer can share certain attributes about your existing customer, like right? in the case of a SaaS, right? And based on the, his attributes, let's say he is a high value customer, right? You know, someone who's been with you for very long, I can show him, I can use JavaScript to show him like 
a customized message, for example, you say, hey, you know, I don't, I don't know what it is, it's just a random example, but these are things you can do because you can use JavaScript, you know that uh, this guy is, is a top customer and you can personalize your marketing more for groups like him. And you can personalize it even more for any other group, anything that you are able to identify about this guy. And, you know, you can create a whole different experience for uh, the users. And also, like when you understand uh, more about technology, you know, you, you naturally have more ideas, right? Oh, I want to test this. I want to test that. Because you, you know what's, you know, <laughs> possible in the universe once you... Yeah, you know, I have this like special power, lah, right? You can see like, okay, what if we did this? What if we did that? Did that? Uh, let's test this. Let's test that. Uh, especially, it's especially useful if you work on, uh, you know, if, you, if your product is a web app. Because our product is a web app, right? And anything is on the web. It's like, you know, you can control with JavaScript, right? <laughs> so it's really useful. But if, if you don't work with a web app, it's fine. A website is fine too, right? Let's say you have a marketing, a landing page. A landing page, you want to, show a different headline to people who come from a different country. You can do all of that with JavaScript, you know? It's just, just such an amazing tool. And I'm, I'm not even like touched the surface. Like, like I haven't talked about cookies yet. Cookies is also, and I think it's, it's freaking amazing, you know, like the things you can do when you can store information about visitors that come to your website. <laughs> and you can remember them and, you know, do something, do the sorts of crazy things mm -hmm. when they come back. Yeah. Cool stuff. Uh, another thing that I think we've talked about is uh, after you learn, you know, um, JavaScript and, you know, a lot of coding stuff, you have been building your own plugins. And uh, tell us more about your plugins and tell us you know, what are your plans or how do you market your plugins? Yeah, I mean, because I work in a SaaS company, right? And I'm like, you know, talking to developers every day, you know, trying to tap into their minds, you know, what goes on behind you. Uh, you know, what goes on in their head when they're building an app and everything. And naturally, I got uh, very interested. I, you know, I started picking up uh, Ruby, Ruby on Rails. Uh, JavaScript, of course, you can use it as well uh, in, in building your apps and all. Um, I don't know. It's, it's more like a, like, a, it's like a hobby, you know. It's like a side hobby. Uh, I call like myself Indie Hacker. I think there's like a group of these people out there on Product Hunt, IndieHacker.com. And they are out there just like making like funny apps that make your life easier, right? I made this app, which my own app, uh, which I'm using every day. This is called Video Speed Controller. So as a marketer, right, I tend not to use ad block as much because sometimes you just want to, you know, that. spy on your competitors and see the ads, yeah. Uh, but sometimes these video ads can get quite annoying. So with Video Speed Controller, I just can hit a hot key and then boop, it will skip the ad. So because it's like speed up, right? Nice. <laughs> you know, like five, yeah. five seconds to skip and it's like boom, one second to skip. And like, yeah, it, it saves me a lot of time just because I can use the ad box. So, you know, I, I, I just, every time I face a problem in my daily life, I try to think about how I can use technology to solve it. And most of, most of the time I cannot because I'm not as good a coder yet. You know, I'd, I'd love to be better, right? But uh, I think slowly, lah, huh, in due time, I'll, I'll become a better programmer and yeah. you know, but I, I do have like a much greater appreciation for all the programmers or the, the builders, the founders out there who are creating like cool apps that, you know, make people's lives easier. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been quite, quite fun. So, so let's talk about the marketing for your apps. So, um, how do you market like sort of a plugin and, you know, you mentioned Product Hunt, you know, why should people be on Product Hunt? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I think, you know, there are two ways to market your product. One is the slow methodical approach, which is to, you know, do keyword research to find out what people are looking for and build like a solution for it. And it's not just enough to build the solution. You need to do the whole SEO game to try to, to rank for keywords, right? You know, create content, build backlinks and whatnot. Uh, that's of course one way to, to market your product. The other way is, you know, you're banking on kind of like virality sort of, sort of say to, to grow your product. And many people have done it successfully, right? I think there was one recently where 
you know, they have this AI where they, it just like removed the background from a picture, right? And it went like crazy viral. It was featured, I think it was like the next web and all. And of course, it got number one product hunt of the week. Uh, because just simply because the product is like super cool. And maybe there are, were people searching for a solution like that. Maybe not. But that's the other way I'm talking about. Like sometimes you have a crazy good idea and people don't even know about its existence yet. But once you launch it on a place like Product Hunt, on, you know, beta list, it just explodes, right? You never know. And, you know, that's what people are trying to do every day. Like I see some really good ideas which, are, which they don't have like people actively searching for, but when they launch it, 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 go, it, it did very well. Like for example, there was one website called 1kprojects.com. So, you know, as an indie hacker, I love it because it's basically a marketplace where you can buy and sell uh, tech projects, your unwanted tech projects, like a website or a domain or a simple app that I made for under $1,000, right? So anybody can go there and list it. And, you know, if you see an idea that you like, you can go and buy it, that sort of thing. So uh, that there was another product that won, uh, you know, product hunt of the day and it gained a lot of traction and, you know, a lot of people went and, try and sell their, their apps. You know, I, even I sold uh, one of my small uh, Chrome extensions up there. So uh, I think it's really good that, you know, there are communities like Product Hunt to help developers, creators to, to have their products, you know, be seen, right? Great yeah, so, stuff. yeah. Yeah, great stuff. It's so interesting when, you know, try to market a, a web application. So I, I really love this interview. There, there were a lot of actionable insights, uh, but just to share with our audience, uh, what are the resources uh, do you use to learn marketing you know, as a SaaS marketer or just as a marketer in general? Yeah. Uh, okay, so what I would recommend is, uh, you know, check out those blogs by those, uh, you know, so, so SaaS, we use a lot of tools and tools to manage our SaaS metrics. Uh, you know, for example, there are tools like Chartmogul and uh, Bear Metrics, and I think there was another one, Profit Well. So check out their blogs because they they really you can learn a lot about how uh, you know you can learn a lot about SaaS metrics. You know how to get like how to to grow your your SaaS business, how to manage your track and manage your your metrics well. They share a lot of cool insights. Uh, for more like marketing related stuff, like I follow this guy, his name is Brian Balford. Uh, he, he's not as active as much recently, but he was the ex VP of growth of Hub, HubSpot. Uh, and I think he's running the Reforge program right now, which is like a course for marketers somewhere in the States. Uh, so the guy is super duper smart. I draw a lot of inspiration from him as well. Uh, and I think I shared with you, Bob, about Nathan Latka. Nathan Latka, he, he interviews a lot of SaaS uh, founders and marketers as well. And he's got a cool podcast as well. Uh, can learn a lot about, uh, you know, people who run SaaS companies from him as well. Yeah. Great stuff. Thanks for sharing. Uh, one more. So uh, as a marketer, what are the tools, you know, besides keyword 2 all of course, <laughs> what are the tools um, that you, uh, you would recommend, uh, you know, a digital market to use? What are the tools that you normally use? Yeah. Uh, three tools I would recommend and the best part is they are all free to use and I think every marketer should at least try and master it a bit lah, right the first one is Google Tag Manager because Google Tag Manager is like it's like a, a tool a web app <laughs> of sorts where you can use to manage all your codes because you're gonna as a marketer you're gonna be dealing with many services Facebook ad, ads uh, Google ads and you know, email marketing software. So each of these platforms have their own pixels and codes which you need to put into your, your website, right? So having that one Google Tag Manager will allow you to really organize, you know, Marie Kondo method, your codes <laughs> into, into, you know, proper tags and triggers and stuff like that. Uh, but it's a lot more than just a place for you to push code, you know, Tag Manager. Like for example, uh, Tag Manager allows you to easily push out your own code. That's why I say like, if you know some JavaScript, you can do some really ninja stuff. So uh, using Tag Manager, you can like, for example, uh, you can show 
let's say you're doing a webinar, right? And you want to show the checkout button like 30 minutes into the webinar. So you can use Tag Manager to specify that after 30 minutes on this page, show this widget, show the, 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 the buy now button, stuff like that. So, you know, just some of the cool things you can do with Tag Manager, you know, besides managing your code. Uh, second one, second tool, Google Analytics, right? Google Analytics is free, you know, and like you can do so much things with it. You can use it to create reports, your daily reports, track conversion rates, you know, figure out what, uh, you can even use Google Analytics together with Google Tag Manager to figure out what are, to do a bit of like, uh, how you say, product, product development, because you can, for example, you can see what are the most clicked features on your web app itself. If, if you're running a web app, uh, you can do it for mobile app as well, actually. Uh, so getting the feedback in, in terms of, you know, quantitative numbers, like what are the things that people click on the most, you can send that feedback to your product team and iterate on your product. Uh, such a cool thing to, to have, right? But other than that, Google Analytics is the go-to tool when it comes to tracking uh, website behavior. People, traffic that comes to your website, what pages did they go, how long they spend, all that kind of stuff. So you definitely have to master that. Uh, what else? Uh, I think the third one, oh yeah, the third one is called Google Optimize. So basically, yeah, it's like Optimizely, or I think there was another one, but uh, basically it's free. You know, and concurrently, you can run up to five tests at one time. So I think five tests at one time is quite a lot uh, in the beginning. Uh, you can always upgrade to their paid version. I think it's quite expensive. But for the free version, you can, you can run a lot of split tests and it's so, super duper easy to use. You know, you just have to put a code on the page and then they have like a web-based editor where you can just change elements and then let the test run and then you can see what's the result. You know, so, uh, you know, always be testing, right? Yeah, Marketers, be testing. Yeah. All right. Yes. So these three tools, highly recommended. Great stuff. Um, so uh, because you are such, a, you know, like a, a person deep into keywords, uh, when it comes to every year, they always say there are different, uh, you know, ranking factors for Google. Uh, so uh, do you say any change for this year or like what do you think is the future for ranking factors? Hmm, future, huh? <laughs> wow. Uh, you know, I think it's not so much about the ranking factors. No one knows, right? Everyone's trying yeah. to predict, but Google doesn't, doesn't really tell really? anyone. Yeah. yeah, unless you attend some kind of search conference and then there's some Google guy and you try to get information from him. That's what most people like to do. Uh, again, you know, I, I don't like to... Uh, okay, I don't know. I don't know what is going to be the next big ranking factor in 2019, but I'm more like, I stick to fundamentals, right? You know, figure out what people are searching for, create good content, you know, uh, get backlinks, quality backlinks, help people so, so that you can rank for these keywords eventually and slowly build up, right? It takes time. SEO will take, it's, it's a long process. It's not an overnight thingy, right? And it, in the long term, if you do things right, uh, there's a lot of benefits that come in the long term because as your domain authority gets better, it's easier for you to rank for more keywords and bring in even more organic traffic to your website. So, yeah. Great, Great stuff. Okay, it's almost uh, an hour since we've talked. Uh, one, one last <laughs> question. This is more, the more interesting question. Um, you, uh, in your earlier career, you, you were actually a pharmacist, am I right? So yep. um, you transition from a pharmacist to a marketer. So how, at what point uh, did you know that, you know, you, you sort of wanted to do uh, marketing and, you know, uh, any advice out there for people who are like, you know, discovering what they really want to do? Yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, in my first year as a pharmacist, working as a pharmacist, I already decided that, you know, this is, uh, you know, I don't want to be here forever. I want to do digital marketing, right? Uh, of course, I, I didn't make the leap immediately. I actually sat with that, you know, that feeling, that idea uh, for a couple of years. I actually ended up working for like three and a half years as a pharmacist uh, before making the leap. And also I have to work on some plan B as well, you know, in case things don't work out and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, always do you know, preparation, always do a lot of research before you make a big move 
but not too much, you know, and that, uh, paralysis by analysis, you don't want to end up there. Sometimes you have to take risks as well, right? And, uh, I'm, you know, I'm glad it worked out for me um, so far. <laughs> Everything is good, uh, hopefully. But if you are thinking of, you know, coming into the digital world, you know, by all means, come. It's great, you know, like it's amazing. We're exciting time right now, I think, and there's a lot to learn, a lot to grow and a lot to experience you know like the world is moving so fast internet is we're already in the fourth industrial revolution blah, 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 blah. so you know if not now then when right when you're gonna come over right come and join us right bob <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it just, in another like um supplementary question to that like you got your first marketing job uh, i presume at mind valley right so yeah how, what made uh you know like Mind Valley hire you as a marketer, you know, like you have no prior experience and how, yeah. how do you find your first marketing job? <sighs> how did I get hired at uh, Mind Valley? As a marketer. Okay, I, I, you know, I, I don't know for sure, you know, maybe there are some hidden powers behind the scenes <laughs> or what, but, but I can tell you what happened now. Okay. I actually applied for the copywriter role at Mind Valley and they gave me this test, uh, write a sales page on this product. And I actually, I did the test and I sent it back and they said I was too salesy. So I did actually didn't get the role as a copywriter. But, you know, it turns out they, they had another opening for traffic specialists. And at the time, I had like no idea what, what is a traffic specialist, you know. Uh, actually, I did have an idea, but I didn't know like what it entails kind of thing like. And so, uh, you know, I applied for that role. I sat for some interviews, you know, I, I gave it all I got. Uh, and of course, I didn't go there empty-handed, right? I, at that point in time, Remember I said like I didn't quit my job as a pharmacist. I spent those years like preparing myself, you know, figuring out what, what is it with online marketing? You know, how do you actually make money online? Uh, and thankfully, I had some references. Uh, I didn't actually manage to make much money, on, money online, but I also did a ton of experiments and I failed, you know. Like, like now, you know, I'm still experimenting with stuff every day and I'm still failing every day, but... Yeah, so basically I took all these, my learnings and everything, I came to my Valley and I showed them what I got. This is everything I've done. I failed more than all your marketers combined, <laughs> you know, and, and I made my pitch and, you know, it worked out, uh, you know, and I've never looked back ever since. Great, that, yeah. that is gold. That is the best part of this interview. Like, you know, do your research and then go in, prepare for an interview and, you know, like show them like your, your skills because everyone can, can learn the skills. So great stuff, Kayong. Um, so we come to the end. Thank you, Thank you for uh, taking this challenge and being on the show. So <laughs> thanks yeah, for having me, the, man. All the best for Keyword 2 IO. So thanks, man. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. See you. See you.